already have action. I already have you already did? All right. Hello there, Seventh Hour people or whoever is watching us. So we left off. We talked about the Puritans. We, if you remember, Lydia, before, before lunch, if you can remember back that far, who is the, who is the Puritan governor and, and pastor who said, we want to be a city on a hill to be a model to the rest of the, the, rest of the world? John Winthrop, yeah. You guys should play devil's tennis, good team. John Winthrop, uh, and then we had another guy whose first name is actually a very lucrative crop in the South, but he also um, is, is responsible for some of the, the witch trials that happened, partially, and he was one of the first people to, well, one of the first white people, I guess, to notice that slaves from Africa had ways to treat smallpox and other things. Who was that, Brady? Remember his name? You can look at your notes. You can look at your notes. His first name is, first name Cotton, last name, Definitely is though. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure. Pot Mather's on the test. I think he is. But William Penn definitely is. William Penn, super super wealthy Englishman, but he 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 basically leaves the uh, Church of England and starts his own thing. Um, well, he be, I mean he he doesn't really start the Quakers, but he leaves he leaves his church to become a Quaker. Goes to Pennsylvania, seeks out on his own, and establishes this, this new colony, which ends up being named after him. And th so the Quakers, I mean, they're around, they're a different religious group. They are, they, so they also call the Religious Society of Friends. That's actually their official name. And they are very re religiously tolerant, unlike the Puritans, probably. And you will see, if there is a primary document that you'll look at, a letter from William Penn uh, to the native tribes in Pennsylvania. And they, more so than other groups in the colonies, are a lot more accommodating, a lot more friendly when it comes to their relationships with Native Americans and things. Except for something, something called the, uh, and you heard John Green talk about it, after William Penn is gone, his sons are involved in this, the, uh, the Walking Purchase Treaty of the, I don't know, 1700, something. And basically what they did is they kind of conned, they conned the Indian tribes. And they, so they had this treaty, and they said, well, 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 you know, we want some more land, like usual. And natives are like, okay, well, you know, we'd rather avoid, like, mass get inside, so we'll give you some land. So, but what they agreed to do is, if they say, we're going to send out a guy, three guys, and just as far as they can walk in a day, that's how much land we get. And then native tribes are like, all right, sounds good. They estimate that's maybe like 40 miles or so. So they're not, but they, they get like the fastest guys in the colony, and they just take off sprint, and, and they end up getting like you know three times as much land as, as what the natives thought they were going to get. So tricky, tricky Pennsylvania people, and they expanded them. Yeah, that's how they expanded Pennsylvania even farther. So, but the Quakers, you know, pretty pretty famously not violent. Uh, later on, we'll learn about how they are some of the first ones to really start um, the abolition movement in the North. And yeah, harming, kind of pretty chill on, on uh, practicing different religions and stuff if you're in Pennsylvania. So some interesting practice. One of the society, the society of Friends, um, one person that's kind of notable at the time is called the Universal Friend. And probably one of, one of the more well-known, publicly documented um, I mean, they wouldn't have used the words transgender, but basically this person had an experience, uh, like a spiritual experience at some point, and, and, and like said, well, you know, that person died, and now I am kind of like, I don't have a, a gender anymore or whatever. So, and, this, and, and it was called, the, they were called the Universal Friend, and most of the podcasts on that one sound pretty interesting. That, they, they were alive around the end of the 1700s, so a little bit after this, 
anybody use with Plank? Contemporaries with Ben Franklin and some other people that we'll study later on. Oh, but actually, we talked about Ben Franklin today, and he's got a nice primary source to read about. So, other colonies, uh, don't write anything here. You're good. I know you wanted to. I know you wanted to, but that's, you know. Delaware is, that, I didn't, I learned this last year. I didn't know why Delaware was called Delaware, but it's named after the guy, Dan Delar. And New Jersey also settled by Quakers, but anyway. If you have any New Jersey people here, John Green's always talking about on New Jersey, so I should probably avoid that. New York, is started, New York is started by the Dutch, you're then taken over by the English, but that's why you have like a lot of, um, we'll get into that later on. Alexander Hamilton's family that he marries into, the Schuylers are uh, their Dutch descendants. Some other groups have legal land holdings up there. All right, lifestyles of the rich and not so famished. So down south, things are good. You have, you probably have, you have a lot more economic disparity though. You got super rich people that live in places like this. I believe this is in, I don't know where, I can't remember where I found this picture. I think this is in Williamsburg. I'd love to take you all to Williamsburg. Because they kind of, you know, they, they have the old time colonial, all the, all the houses there and everybody dresses up and talks like colonists and it's kind of fun. When I went there as a freshman in high school with my parents, they did a mock, kind of like a mock court trial. And they, they basically pulled me out of the crowd to be like this teenager on trial for something. And I had like the made up crime was I like stolen a pint of ale or something from the local tavern and drinking it all or something. So they put me on trial for that and they put me in the stocks. So you know, you know your hands go in there. Uh, if you're a Native American. So at this time, there's, you know, as we get closer to um, the French and Indian War and the American Revolution, there's less violence, at least for a time. Things have kind of, you know, there's more treaties and stuff like that, but there's still, you know, usually they get the they get the bad end of these land deals, right? Like I just talked about the Walking Treaty and other ones, like like Manhattan, um, where the when the Dutch buy from the Indians, that's some people say like as low as twenty four dollars. You know, there's some controversy on that, but basically the general thing is they, they don't they don't get a fair shake when it comes to their so kind of lose those situations for them. Either they give up their land or they have to, you know, fight the Europeans or they end up fighting other tribes and and there's conflict over that. So you have intertribal warfare too that, that really takes off. So the man's on resources by life jeopardize your traditional lifestyle. It's just it's not a it's not a good situation for them. So you can try to change how you're living and assimilate, become, you know, more like the European. Or your other option is move west, and that's what most do. Most of them just decide to move west, including a lot of tribes that end up in Kansas, like the Shawnee and the, well, in that, in that Kansas. And who else? The Osage, some of those. So when you see some of those names around Kansas, those people are actually back here this time. If you're African American, you're most likely to say, let's see if there's anything particular that I want you for, to for sure get. Uh, I mean, the Middle Passage is, is also basically just the transatlantic slave trade, but that's that's the voyage from from Africa to the Americas. And like we said earlier, so some of this you already know, some of this you already have. Only about 70% or so survive. Um, obviously, lucky is using quotes because it's not a good life you're necessarily headed to. Probably, if you end up if you end up in the colonies, you're better off than millions of other ones that ended up in South America or the Caribbean, where their life expectancy was super low, um, like 23 years old or whatever. For a lot of them, so in the South, that's actually the first time that the slave population reproduces naturally. Like they live long enough and are able to, because what what a lot of the Southern owners found out is, hey, it's a lot more, it's also a lot more economically beneficial to us if if our slaves have their own children and then we have more slaves as opposed to you know buying them and having to ship over. You're, you're also going to start seeing countries are already in the 1700s putting bans on slavery, bans on slave importation, things like that. The United States is going to trail behind that a little bit, but you know England does it before us. Um, France does some things before us. Some other places, the Dutch. A lot of these European countries actually shut down slavery before the United States. So slavery goes due to several factors. We talked about declining labor from England. Those indentured servants aren't coming over um, like they used to, and we found out the African slaves survived better. 
you know, better, uh, especially in the south because they, they, they handle malaria or they're less susceptible to malaria. And the stuff that they're growing is more profitable. Cotton, rice, tobacco, those things are in high demand in Europe, European markets, so more money for everybody. I mean, when I say everybody, we're talking like, you know, 5% of the, of the really rich landowners in Virginia and stuff. You already heard about Bacon's Rebellion, but that you know that also was a was a push to increase slavery. So these are your these are your factors that increase slavery some. And you start to see natural reproduction of, uh, among slaves. So the good news is there, slaves are living longer in the United States. Uh, they're allowed to you know in, intermarry within sometimes even even within plantations, different plantations. Like you could have um, a spouse in a neighboring plantation and things like that. And, and sometimes owners would even let you you know, they make a deal and sell you to go live there and stuff like that. So there's all kinds of, you know, different different scenarios where some owners are nicer than others and stuff. But the ultimate reality is not not a good situation. And, you know, part of, the, part of the bad part about this is you have, you know, you have enslaved mothers who have children and sometimes they get to keep their children, but what happens other times? Maybe, you know, one of the most abhorrent, brutal parts of it is their kids are sold off to other other people, and that's another way to for the slave owners to get profits. So it becomes it becomes what they call chattel slavery, kind of a kind of different than how slavery is practiced in some cultures. So like when you when you hear uh, when I guess when slavery is kind of talked about in, in ancient texts like in the Bible or in Greek society or in different places. That's some, in some instances, almost more like the indentured servant model that we talked about, where like you're a slave for a while, or maybe like for a war debt for your family or whatever. Uh, but you do have some freedoms and things like that. Not so much chattel slavery. This chattel means you're basic, you know, you're, you're straight up property, you're, you're more like, kind of like livestock or something. Um, and that's thanks to the slave codes they passed in Barbados. Barbados down in the Caribbean um, needed a way to really keep things in check because in Barbados, your, your slave population was like 90% of the people, and only 10% were like your your white landowners and stuff. So there was, they had to have a way to kind of keep people in check, or they would be victim to rebellion and stuff like that. And eventually, that's what's going to happen in Haiti and other places. Slaves will rebel, and they, in, in some cases, they they win and they do get their freedom. But took all rights away from slaves, made them and any children they may have property. So this is, I mean, it, it starts here, Barbados, but this is what American slavery will look like. Same thing. It's inspired by that, though. In fact, one of the key figures in the Salem Witch Trials, he comes from Dallas. Like his family is, runs a plantation in Barbados, and sugar crop or the sugar bias drops, they kind of lose all their money. So he brings them, he, he, he moves back to Massachusetts to the rest of his family. And he brings with him his his slave woman named Tichuba, and she will play a pretty big role in this switch trial stuff that we get into. Back down south, social hierarchy is more defined than the north. So you have you know the really wealthy people living in their big plantation houses. Oh, if we have time, we should dress the colonists today. That's always a fun activity. And the family and church centers are. Kind of less defined, you know. Family family structure is a little more different, but, or varies a little more than up north in New England. And church isn't maybe quite as big a deal. Still a pretty big deal, but not maybe not as big a deal up in um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony and different places. Northern colonies enjoy greater comparative economic equality, so you don't have you don't have quite the difference between your super wealthy plantation owners and your lower class. Um, you have you know, kind of more common workers, lots of farmers, tradesmen, that sort of things. There's still slavery up in a lot of the northern colonies. It should be remembered up until, in fact, most of them will have slavery up until like right around the time of the Constitution and post-revolution days. That's when they start, that's when they start abolishing it. Um, it's not near as economically um, beneficial as it is in the South Coast. You don't see it as much. And you start to see more of kind of an ethnically diverse group of I mean, ethnically diverse in the terms of we're still all, they're still all, um, you know, European white people, but you got people from Scotland and Ireland and Germany, and you got different religious groups, Quakers, Puritans, Presbyterians, Baptists, Catholics, that sort of thing. Depending on where you are, if you're in Massachusetts, you better be a Puritan or things don't go well for you. Well, you can be there, they're just not very nice to you. 
overall colonies offered much more equality and opportunity than in England if you were white. So, so it's still like there's still a big economic job. Like if you're some just some common Englishman or woman, and you look at America, it's looks pretty good. You can get your farmland. You got economic opportunity in other areas. Uh, you're usually in society, your clergy were most respected. Who are clergy? Who are we talking about? The what? Yeah, your church leaders, your pastors, and that sort of thing. <laughs> Doctors are good. So the medical science, you know, is still, still needs to go a long ways. Doctors are good at bleeding people. So, you know, they thought if you were sick, well, you got some bad blood in you, so we should drain that out of you. Not great at stopping epidemics, though. Um, you know, we are talking about how a lot of the Native Americans are susceptible to diseases and stuff. So are, so are colonists, smallpox is something that kills people all over the place. Malaria, dysentery. What are some other fun old diseases that we don't have to worry about much anymore? Cholera, cholera is a good one. Typhoid, what? Oh yeah, 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 and that's still that's still kind of around. Yeah. We don't have to worry about it as much, but yeah, like when it was some prairie dog somewhere, or they think some somebody maybe in China this summer ate a some sort of rodent and maybe got some food on it. Yeah, I mean it's still a thing, but yeah. uh, traders and merchants. So this, so now we're starting. So we're getting into um, so the the Salem witch trials happens in 1692. We really are fast forwarding through some time here, about 200 years. In, colonial history. But we're getting into some things. 1733, we're getting closer to the American Revolution. So stuff's going to start to happen to, to drive, you know, make the colonists be a little, you know, a little more unhappy with the English. They're the mother country. This is one of those things, the Molasses Act. So, hey, this, this happened in Boston. Ava, when you were in Boston, did you hear anything about the big molasses flood of the early 1900s? <laughs> my, dad, my daughter read a book about this this summer. It's one of these crazy, um, I bet a ton of people in Boston don't even know about this either. Okay, don't yeah, it. yeah, it's not it. But in the, in the early 1900s, there was this, this molasses company, because you could get all kinds of, like in that area in England, like coming from Vermont and Maine and New Hampshire and stuff, um, from all the, you know, they tap into the trees, get the sap, all that stuff. So there's all this molasses, and this is a big part of their trading back then too. But in the 1900s, they, they had like this huge, enormous tank of it in uh, some, some part of Boston. And basically it was like poorly made and, and it, it like sprung a leak and collapsed. And this, this like 50 foot tall wave of molasses just comes flowing down the street, taking out horses and kids and cars and people. And, and, and it, was, it was a pretty sticky situation. But uh, I think it killed like they killed like 50 people, so it was a big deal. So my daughter read this book, like, I Survived the Molasses Flood or whatever. And this girl is riding her horse, and her horse, and she get caught in the flood. They survived, but she is kind of injured. So. Anyway, what happens here is the English government says, we're not going to let you trade your molasses anymore with the French West Indies. So places now like, like Haiti would be in the French West Indies. So we're talking about islands that are kind of off the coast of Florida. Um, down in the Gulf of Mexico, but they weren't allowed to trade with them anymore. And that ticked off the, the English, because it really disrupted, I mean, it ticked off the colonists, because it really disrupted their whole chain of, like they would they would trade some molasses for slaves, or they would trade some molasses for other material, sugar, bring it up there, and, you know, yeah, so they had a good, good thing going. Um, so a lot of colonial merchants just ignored it and continued to smuggle their stuff. That's gonna be a problem later, foreshadowing. By the mid 18th century, when we say 18th century, we're talking like 1750s, right? So you all, whenever you see a something century, you subtract 100, and that's what year you're in. Congregationalist, that's the Puritans, that's another thing, because they believe that the, the leadership of the church should be more on a congregational level and not like not like the Church of England, the Anglicans, or even the Catholics, where you have like, you know, you have like your bishops and your, your popes and things like that. They thought, no, that would be just kind of people in the congregation. Which is, I mean, this is a big influence of, of local democracy later on. Decisions made at a local level. So, uh, that's why that word is kind of bold. I know the Puritans believe in congregational leadership or whatever. Uh, other than that, I don't think there's anything else you need to know really. Like, I have Armenian in red, but yeah, it's, I, it's 
hung on the test. Is that a, but there were people like Ann Hutchinson uh, who said, hey, free will is, is also a thing. Like it's, you know, people aren't necessarily, it's not outside their control of like their salvation and stuff like that. So still kind of a, a point of contention in the Christian church today sometimes. Those are two schools about so the Great Awakening happens, and this is, and then, you know, we have several things happening that are eventually going to lead us to revolution, and this is part of that. Uh, but there's a movement focused on emotion and the individual's connection to God. So you have, like, you have a lot of, a lot of years past where, like, the church is still kind of a big part of society, but it's not so much about, like, you as an individual. It's more about kind of this group structure, and, I mean, you would go to church and stuff, and it wasn't, it wasn't like. It wasn't emphasized as much like your own personal relationship with with God and that sort of thing. So that, this this becomes a, a big deal then. But so this word right here, individual is kind of important. As we get in, as we start studying like big themes of history, I talked about American exceptionalism the other day and this feeling that America is somehow a little bit different than other people and maybe a little bit better. Or Another big common belief in, in American society is individualism. Like you do, like we're a lot more individual based than, than other societies that are called like more collectivist. Like they want to focus more on like, you know, the, it's the family, the community is kind of a bigger deal. So this is another one of those things that early on, like you're, you're kind of, you know, you and your faith is kind of your own business type thing, um, which is a little different than other places in the world. Two big names in this, Jonathan Edwards is the one that I think there's, this is this is the, the document that he writes that you need to know and that you'll read a little bit of, and I think there might be a test question about this, but he, his famous sermon is Sinners in the Hands of the Name of God, and it's super long, so I'm going to find like a super small excerpt for you and basically just, just know that he wrote it, and, and his, his whole message is that like people are, and he comes from the Puritan side of things, people are completely dependent on on the grace of God. So it's not anything that you know you you individually would do. George Whitefield, same message, but he's kind of a little not as harsh. Like I mean if you're titling your sermon centers in the hands of the name of God, that comes off as yeah, a little a little bit harder. George Whitefield's message is a little softer than that. Edwards is the one you probably really If you went to school back then, you might read this in a book. And this comes from like your little, whatever, your readers that you would get. So, he who never learns his ABC, forever well block it be, but he who learns his letters fair shall have a coach to take the air. So, what does that mean, kids? Mm -hmm. Learn your alphabet, I guess. Learn to read and write. Ben Franklin becomes the colony's renaissance man. He's going to play a big role in, in um, all kinds of stuff. He's going to go to France for a while. He's involved with the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and all this stuff. Uh, but he is known at this time as, you know, he's a scientist, he's a writer, politician, uh, already developing a reputation for being a bit of a ladies' man. And when you look at the primary sources, when Franklin writes a letter to an acquaintance of his, basically giving this, this younger man tips on, on dating, finding a mistress, that sort of thing. Uh, you can read that if you want, pretty interesting stuff. And he comes up with all these little quotes and stuff. He has tons of quotes that are probably not stuff that Ben Franklin said to be a tribute to him. But apparently he said something like this, fish and visitors think in three days. There's a little quote that showed up in the papers back here. Yeah, there's something. Let's, let's pass forward through some of this. Here's a guy you need to know. He's an understudy guy. John Peter Zinger. So we talked earlier about, you remember, what was what was the the thing that was passed in Maryland? Well, it was actually passed in New England, too, but they passed their own Maryland version. And it led to the First Amendment later on. You remember what that was? It was an act of something. What'd you say? Right. Act of yeah, toleration. Right. Act of toleration. So that's gonna that's gonna be kind of a pre precursor to the First Amendment, and then so will this. But this involves the other part of the First Amendment. The First Amendment has several things in it: you know, freedom of religion, freedom of assembly, 
Freedom of speech and freedom of the what? Like newspapers and stuff. Right? Freedom of the press. That's this is kind of a this is a big trial that goes a long way towards that being established like this is a big deal in America, freedom of the press. So John Peter Zinger, he writes some bad stuff about uh, the royal governor. Uh, this is in uh, New York, I believe. And they call that seditious libel. Uh, so he is put on trial for that. But the jury says he's not guilty. So he wins the case. Long story short, they basically say, you can say bad stuff about people in the paper if you want to. You're not get in trouble for it. Uh, which is kind of true today still. But you can still get in trouble for libel if you say it and it's not true. And then they can prove that it caused harm to their character, that sort of thing. But basically, he didn't say anything incorrect. It just made the governor look bad. So the jury said, not guilty. You can say that if you want to. And it, it became, it was a big deal at the time because up till that point, eh, the governor pretty much could do what he wanted with you if you were a a uh, newspaper person and had published bad things about them. So this is a big win for freedom of the press at the time. And later on, that'll be, that'll show up in the first amendment as well. I think we are, but yeah, two slides left. So, voting rights. Yeah, this is, this is all stuff that's gonna, gonna play a big role in our next unit. But this is how the politics are set up in the colonies. You have you have a lot of two house legislatures. Yeah, that's probably asking me to write down, but that that's kind of how our modern government is going to be structured. Uh, you do have voting rights, but they're narrowly defined by property, religion, race, and gender. So basically, who do you think gets to vote in colonial society? What? White men. White men. Not only white men. You they they narrow it down even more than that. With land. Landowners, white men who own land, and typically they have to be a professed member of whatever church it is. Not everywhere, but like in Puritan, in, in, in the Massachusetts State Colony, you have to be a Puritan. Um, yeah, so pretty limited voting rights, but they do have some. Now, are they voting for like the King of England? No, they're voting for like just local, you know, local, local guys and stuff, sheriff and the magistrate and that sort of thing. Uh, but all the other stuff is done, you know, like your governor, your other people in charge, they are coming from, they're coming from London, they're coming from, they're what's called royal or proprietary leadership. They're people that the king, parliament has sent to the colonies to be in charge in a lot of times. I think this is the last slide. So. By the 1770s, right before, right before the American Revolution starts, which that's our next unit, the colonies are, you know, we talked about all the differences between the North and the South colonies, but really they had a lot more in common too. You got a common language, so they're all, you know, most of these people are coming from, if not, if not England, at least Europe, most of them are kind of from the same area. And there's a lot of social and economic mobility, a lot more so than what they had in Europe. You know, you do kind of have that that ability to start as, you know, you could start as an indentured servant and work your way up to owning your own land and having, um, you know, having a pretty comfortable lifestyle. Again, you know, if you are white. Now there are a lot of free, I think there's another side earlier. There's plenty of free black people too, um, but they, you know, they're not gonna have voting rights, uh, gonna be limited property ownership depending on where they're at. You know, they might have um, more progressive laws in some places than others. Uh, there's a lot more self-government. You know, like London's all the way across the ocean. So people get used to doing stuff kind of on their own and governing themselves. And that's a big deal. They used to call them their own shots. Uh, most of them are Protestant. There are, you know, this, where, where are the Catholics at? I mean, they're kind of, they're in different places, but one colony especially is, is dominated by Catholics. Do you remember which one that is? Maryland. Yeah. So, so you have, you do have that, but you got, at, at this time it's a lot more, you know, it's a lot probably more even now really than it was then. Uh, geographic proximity to each other and not England. So, you know, if you're in Massachusetts, you're still a long ways from Virginia, but you're a heck of a lot closer to them than you are to England. So this is bringing us together as, you know, these colonies are growing closer together and that's gonna be even farther apart from England and that's gonna play a role in the next couple of years. So that's it, that's it, you're done, you're done. Since we have, what time is it? You 